Okay, thanks. So my, my paper, which I'll just briefly introduce uh, for, for 10 minutes, is about uh, the, the question of trust, the problem of trust in government, trust in, in institutions and trust in society. And the question is whether uh, open data, and in particular open government data, uh, being released onto the web can uh, help with the problem of trust in society. And I should, it's worth prefacing uh, my remarks with just an observation that uh, trust, the problem of trust is often conceptualised as the difficulty of uh, how, do, how do we increase trust in society and that's obviously not the right way to think of it and, 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 and it's clear because what you don't want is a situation where there's lots of trust but also lots of untrustworthy people because then you get uh, widespread fraud. What you want, the problem of trust boils down to two components. The first is uh, how do we increase trustworthiness in society and then the second component is how do we ensure that our trust is well placed so that we trust all and only trustworthy people. And the paper, we, uh, uh, the paper alludes to uh, some work I've been doing with uh, the UK government, the, the, uh, the Home Office, which is the UK Interior Ministry and the uh, Ministry of Justice, uh, to uh, uh, put out data in such a way that the data are, are trusted uh, and um, used by, by stakeholders and accepted as such. So, so the paper actually looks at uh, trust through the lens of three uh, particular political uh, uh, theories that, that uh, span from uh, left to right. The first one I, I use is social capital theory, perhaps the, the, the leading exponent being Robert Putnam. And in his view, what, what's trust? Well, trust is expectation, an expectation that arises from honest and cooperative behaviour between people, which is driven by uh, community norms. So in other words, we, in a community we work together, we socialise, we cooperate, we have gains, we trust each other more, we socialise more, we cooperate more. And there's a virtuous circle where trust, cooperation and social gain kind of increase. And conversely, you can get into a vicious circle where uh, trust declines, cooperation declines, benefit declines, trust declines and so on. Uh, and what role does transparency play in that sort of area? Well, it empowers civil society. The, the uh, citizens and little groups of people can understand their, their fellow people more. They, they, can, uh, they understand their community more. They have more facts about things like crime, uh, transport volume, whatever. Uh, and they, they, uh, uh, groups can carry out their own projects uh, more successfully. So that's the, the role of transparency in social capital theory. The second theory I, 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 I've, been, I've been using is uh, rational choice theory, and this uh, uh, the work of Russell Hardin is, is very important here. So trust in that area, um, that sort of that follows from aligning the interests of the truster and the trustee. So in other words, the the trustee works in the truster's interests uh, for reasons that are grounded in the truster's interests, and that, according to Hardin, is when we get trust and the role of transparency in that sort of scenario is that uh, if, we're if, if, if the facts are transparent, then I can see what the trustees' interests are. This is why uh, politicians have to publish all sorts of information about who's donating to their campaigns, so we can see where their interests lie. And then the third uh, area, uh, the third theory I, I use is deliberative democracy theory. Uh, so I uh, kind of wave Habermas around at this point, but uh, uh, Rorty might be another possibility. But here, trust uh, allows deliberation between conflicted, conflicted parties to take place in good faith. So everyone discusses their problems, uh, there, there's proper deliberation, it takes place in good faith. We know that all the cards are on the table uh, and everyone, uh, everyone at least knows uh, that the, the discussion is open and honest. Uh, transparency obviously provides a foundation for those judgments of good faith, so we know that all the cards are on the table. We know that there are no hidden cards uh, uh, being, being held back. And how does open data fit into that sort of area? Well, three ways really. O o open data provides three types of information that can be useful in promoting trust in, all in the eyes of all three of these theories. So the first one is it provides information about government, so we can see what governments do. Uh, why they do them and hold them to account as a result. Uh, secondly, 
government data includes a lot of data about communities. So, for example, something like crime data tells us a lot about the community we live in. And that enables groups and individuals to negotiate their relations with communities, with, with, their, with their, uh, their own communities and other groups uh, within that community. And then thirdly, data can be used to provide innovative services uh, so you, can, you end up with a, 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 an ecosystem or a, an infosphere, as it's been called, where there's a lot of diversity uh, of services and suppliers, both in the public and private sector, and so no one is beholden to particular uh, monopoly service suppliers. So the paper itself, and I, I, I won't go in too much detail about the, the uh, case study, but I, I use a case study from the release in the UK of crime data by the Home Office and criminal justice data by the Ministry of, Ju by the Ministry of Justice, where the idea is that uh, confidence in the police, in the criminal justice system, and in our fellow citizens within our communities will all be uh, bolstered by uh, if we know the facts. And when I talk about confidence, I'm talking about warranted confidence. It's not just, uh, it, it, may be, it may be correct to have a fear of crime, but there's no point. But you should only have a fear of crime if if, it's, if crime is genuinely scary in your area. Uh, and what I wanted to focus on, just what I just wanted to pick out of the case study, was some of the real issues to do with the way that you present data and which data you actually select to publish uh, online, uh, when what you're trying to do is promote warranted trust uh, in in the uh, in, in the institutions and in one's fellow citizen. So. Uh, the first major issue is that different people want different types of data at different levels of aggregation uh, uh, about different things. So everyone wants something different. Different stakeholders want everything, want different things. And the second thing is there are also a lot of stakeholders who want information to be suppressed uh, for perfectly good reasons that might be uh, to do with their, their privacy, it might be to do with uh, potential economic losses or economic gains or it might be to do something like rehabilitation of offenders where people with at least with minor uh, minor uh, offenses behind them uh, have uh, various rights to expunge their their um, their uh, crimes from the record there's also lots of different agencies involved here and they all are independent and operationally independent and usually for good reasons so for example you don't want the police force uh, colluding with the prosecution service in, in a just society or a fair justice system. Uh, and that has led to, over time to uh, very, very diverse uh, uh, data systems that they all use, the various agencies use, that ju just don't talk to each other. Um, it's extremely difficult to put these things together, but the trouble is, in order to in, in order to mer in order to merge data from from these various data sets, you do have to, in some sense, compromise the independence of the various agencies. Context is extremely important in uh, the in, in the context of crime and criminal justice. Uh, so, for example, two guys might commit the same crime. One may be sentenced to one year in prison, and another may be sentenced to two years in prison. And that may seem incredibly unfair, but there's always a rationale for this that is given by the judge and will usually be a long piece of text that may be several pages long uh, explaining the decision. Now, unfortunately, it's very easy to put the, the, uh, the, the number of years served or whatever in the uh, sentence uh, in a piece of open data. It's rather harder to uh, express the long judgment explaining the context uh, in, in RDF or something like that. And then finally, uh, there's another issue with uh, the integrity of the data where you want to make sure that publishing data doesn't degrade the data itself. So, for example, if there was a suspicion that people weren't reporting crimes because they didn't want uh, their crime data to appear on crime maps or other, or other visualizations of, the, uh, uh, of crime in a particular area, uh, then, of course, the publishing of the data would actually be causing the data to be less good and less valuable, uh, and we would need to avoid that. So all those issues need to be taken into account, um, which is just to highlight the problem. The conclusions I reach in the, in the paper, and I, I, I describe some institutions that uh, I, I've been pioneering in, in, in the UK government to uh, ensure, that, um, ensure that they're carried out, are that I mean, basically putting the data out is not enough. Releasing the data is not enough. To promote trust in the data, which is the foundation for 
uh, all the other trust building operations that you want to uh, 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 you want to sit on top of the of the, of the open data. You need uh, the processes of transparency, which really matter for trust. It's not just the rules governing transparency. It's not just the data you put out. It's the processes by which decisions are made uh, to to put uh, information out. Also matter for trust. And uh, uh, there's there's a sort of little. Uh, uh, summarized list of, of, of them. Uh, it's a very multi-stakeholder decision-making process will, will work. In particular, you, you must consult the people who are demanding the data. Data has got to be meaningful for anyone who wants the data, in particular communities and citizens. It's not just the data that the big data corporations uh, are after. Um, I don't need to labor the point, given, given the, the keynote that follows this panel, that civil associations and individuals require privacy in a world where, where, where there's lots of data about. The main point is the transparency process really does need to be transparent. Uh, we need to know when data go out, why it's gone out, why that data was selected, why it was represented in that way, and we also want uh, as many stakeholders pos as possible to be involved in that decision-making process and to be able to scrutinize it. Uh, finally, and one thing that we are a bit short of, we hope at the University of Southampton we'll be able to, uh, to help with this. Uh, we're, we're talking with Home Office officials next month about this, but we need to gather empirical data about the impact so that the theories governing why data get put out on the web uh, get superseded by uh, the facts of the matter when we actually know what the data uh, tell us about how trust has been supported or not supported by the publication of open data. Uh, the main point uh, to, to the, the, the payoff line I'd like to finish is that the legitimacy of transparency, the legitimacy of programs to put data on the web, particularly government de data, depend crucially on public trust in the process of transparency itself. And with that, I'll say thank you.